Hello, Joe Becker here with Paramedical Personnel in Maryland. We've been requested several times from our fellow instructors in reference to doing a first aid class. And I really think that if you see kind of how I structure mine, I've got a PowerPoint put together here for you that you may use the PowerPoint if you want. Let us know, we'll send you out a copy. You can modify the PowerPoint to put some important points in for your location, especially depending on where you're at in the United States or the world for that matter. Uh, to modify it so it fits your location. Uh, but it's just a quick overview of how I do a first aid class and some suggestions on what you can do in yours. Okay, let's get started. Safety first. When you arrive at location, uh, first thing you want to do is find out whether it's safe for you to even be there. And the first question is, am I in danger? If you think there's any possibility of you being hurt or by staying there, you're going to be in danger. You need to get to a safe spot called 911 and wait till help arrives so that you can safely treat your patients. It does us no good for you to be rushing in there and be the next patient down. Okay, stop the bleed video. This is the very first thing we start off with. It's an ASHI video. We've been showing this now since it first came out, which is going on probably about four years. When it first came out, the importance of stop the bleed uh, really struck us all in the fact that this is something that must be done just as fast as CPR. And so we put it into our first aid training right off the bat. It's the very first thing we show. We show the video. That video is into stuffing wounds, tourniquets, etc. And then that's what we do right off the bat. That's part of the beginning training. From that, we go into the rest of the first aid training for the class. Okay, here we go here. Scene safety. If it's not safe, call 911. Stay in a safe area. Uh, and then if they can't speak, you still want to call 911 and assist the patient. Okay? Basic understanding, what do you need to stay alive? Okay? You need to be able to breathe and you need to have blood circulating in the body. That's the two biggies, that's the two important things. So as, as a first aider, what are you looking for? How do you assist the patient? And waiting for 911 to arrive. Getting consent, implied consent. If the person says, don't touch me, then guess what? You can't touch them by law. However, if you say, can I help you, and they can't answer you, they've gone unconscious, it's now called implied consent. And you can actually render care to them legally. It is assumed that if the person was in that bad a condition, they would then want your help. Okay, so it's called implied consent, and then you can go ahead and render care to the patient. Mechanism of injury. Now, we used to teach this in our EMR classes years ago, and it kind of lost favor and now it's kind of back in again. Mechanism of injury is basically what could be wrong with the patient based by what you see around the patient. Okay, things like a car accident, a ladder overturned, a possible fall from at least five foot, maybe the height of the patient. Uh, something stuck in the patient, an object. Uh, somebody struck with something like a bat, a tree limb, a split rim explosion. All these things are things that mechanic of injury wise, if you see that on the scene, you can pretty much assume that those same energy that took place in that explosion or that car strike is also going to be in your patient. Now, does that mean that you see the car fender all rumpled up and you say, oh, they've got internal bleeding? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But by mechanism, you're going to kind of guess what's wrong with that patient based by what you see around that patient. In which case, does that mean you may overtreat? Yes, it does. But believe me, it is much better to overtreat the patient and find out they're okay versus than saying, oh, this patient is just fine. And all of a sudden they go into shock and die right in front of you. Okay? So, mechanism of injury. Mechanism, mechanism, mechanism. Okay, primary survey. So when you're first there with your patient, primary survey, the ABCs really. Are you okay? Can the patient answer you? Many times the patient will say, oh, you know, I hurt my arm. Well, guess what? Your primary survey is done. They got airway, breathing, and circulation because they're talking to you. So primary surveys is no biggie, okay? No response. Next question, are they breathing? No, begin CPR. Uh, if they're breathing, begin or think about secondary survey. What is a secondary survey? Secondary survey is literally a head-to-toe examination of the patient. Okay, you're looking for all kind of things that might be wrong or could possibly be wrong. Or they wince at pain when you're going down their arm, feeling their arm. That's a possible break 
or sprain or something going on and you want to mark that spot. By the way, a little trick for that is if you have some tape, take and tear a little piece of tape and put it on the spot that they re re uh, reacted to when you were touching. That's probably a break or sprain. Okay. No obvious injuries, again, think of mechanism again. Is there possible internal injuries? But a primary and secondary survey when needed. Okay. Now, does everybody need a secondary survey head to toe? Give you an example. You walk up, your patient says, so are you okay? And he goes, hey, I stepped off the curb here and turned my ankle. Okay, there's a curb right there. He's sitting on the curb. Kind of makes sense. Kind of falls in line. He's holding his ankle. Okay, looks like the mechanism will take place here. I really don't need to do a head to toe in this. However, what if he says, hey, I stepped off the curb here and sprained my ankle. And you look and you're out in the middle of a field. There is no curb there. Okay, well, now that brings up the thing as uh, something else is going on here. I can't necessarily trust what he's telling me, and now I need to do a full head-to-toe survey. Okay, so it's not rocket science. It's kind of common sense as to how you approach your patient and what you want to think through what they're telling you. If it makes sense, everything you see, the mechanism will kind of play out what they're saying. Very good. If not, you need to look further into the mechanism. What's taking place here? that's causing my patient not to answer this question correctly. Okay, one of the things you can look for is called dots. It's a way of trying to remember what to look for. Deformity, open injuries, tenderness, and swelling. So if you make little notes on a little piece of paper there as to are there any deformities. And so it's a way of remembering what might be wrong with your patient to tell EMS when we arrive what you're going to tell us what you found in your patient. Okay, external bleeding. And you'll see this as we go through these about putting on gloves. Remember, if you've got gloves, if you don't have gloves, what else can you use? A Ziploc baggie works great. Uh, that's a good thing to have in your first aid kit, or Ziploc baggies, because they come in handy for all kinds of things. But you can use them in place of the gloves to protect you from the blood source. Okay. Uh, once bleeding stops, do not take off the dressing. So if you've applied direct pressure and the bleeding has stopped, leave that top dressing in place. Even if you packed other ones on top, do not remove the initial dressing. Okay, because actually you begin to, to seal the bleeding right there. If you tear that off, it's going to start bleeding again. And of course, 911. That's always important. Okay, severe bleed. Make sure the scene's safe. A cloth bandage, at least one inch wide. And this is if you're going to make your own tourniquet. Now, commercial tourniquets are pretty neat because a commercial tourniquet is very easily to apply to your patient. You can also apply a commercial tourniquet to yourself. That's a big difference. Uh, however, at least at least one inch wide, wrap the bandage two inches above the injury. Now, this is some controversy because some people are saying, put it at the top of the arm. Well, really, you only need it just above where the actual injury is at, where the bleeding is coming from. Um, because if, in fact, they do have to amputate, they'll amputate where your tourniquet is at. So if you put it at the very top of the arm, guess what? They're going to lose the entire arm versus maybe just the lower portion. Okay? So two inches above the injury. That's still what we do. Here's a picture of it. You put the uh, uh, cravat is really great to use for these. Put the stick in there, turn the stick, and literally what you're doing is you're crushing the limb and you're compressing the artery so the bleeding stops. Once you get that stopped, you need to apply a second tourniquet to the area where the stick's at so the stick doesn't pinwheel backwards. Okay, so you got to keep that pressure on. Once a tourniquet is applied, do not remove the tourniquet. Now this goes back to an old wives' tale. They used to talk about every 20 minutes loosening the tourniquet to let some blood out. Well, all you're doing is dumping the blood on the ground and your patient's going to die because of that. So no, once the tourniquet is applied, it stays in place. Do not remove the tourniquet. Okay. What you want to do is make a note of the time you applied the tourniquet. It's nice if you got to stop the bleed kit because in that you've got magic markers. A uh, pen will work too. You want to put it on their forehead. Why? Because it's an easy thing to see. And that's where we will be looking and the emergency room would be looking. In the old days, we used to dip some blood and put a T on their forehead. They, they're not wild about that anymore because blood certainly is a possible spread of co uh, contamination. Uh, so, But you do want to note the time that you applied the tourniquet. Uh, internal bleeding, what happens? This happens inside the body. Not much you're going to be able to see. Uh, sometimes you'll see signs in your patient, some shocky signs uh, that takes place very quickly. And here's the thing in reference to shocky signs, and I'll bring it up now because it's really important to understand this. The older the person, the quick, 
quicker the Schottky signs will be observed. Okay, if myself and a 21 year old hit a tree in a car and busted ourselves up, exact same injuries, I will show Schottky signs almost instantly. By the time you arrive there to start making your assessment, I will have the pale skin, I will have the clammy skin, I will have all the classic signs of going into shock. However, the 21 year old over there, same injuries, chances are he'll be standing beside the car saying, nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. I don't want to go to the hospital. And that's because the adrenaline rush is much greater in that 21 year old than it would be in me. Okay, so he's not going to show signs of shock early on. Adrenaline has the ability to take the arteries of the body, which are made up of muscular tissue, and contract those arteries to maintain blood pressure. Where for me, I don't have that amount of adrenaline to do that, so since I'm dumping blood, my shocky signs come on very quickly. I'm heading down the tubes. Now so is he, he just doesn't show it. And the amount of adrenaline rush, again, higher in the younger, this goes all the way back to infants. And an infant will carry the same type of delay by the time you see the problem taking place, it will be too late to try to compensate for it. So again, mechanism, mechanism, mechanism. If you think it's there, treat as if it were. Okay, you'll be, you'll be glad, they'll be glad that you actually treated them for that. Okay, some shortness of breath, coughing up blood, that's certainly a thing. A knife injury or gunshot wounds. And one of the strange ones we had one time was an ice pick. We had a person stabbed on scene uh, with an ice pick. Now, when you pull the ice pick back out again, it leaves almost no hole in the patient. So the patient wasn't complaining anything. He was doing just fine. All of a sudden, he started showing some signs of shock. His buddy that happened to be there all of a sudden mentioned, oh, by the way, he got stabbed with an ice pick. Okay, that makes a big difference. We ended up flying him and another person into shock trauma. Both of them survived. But it was a quick pickup uh, on the fact that this guy was going into shock and his buddy telling us that he had been stabbed with an ice pick that made all the difference. Had we taken him to a local hospital, chances are he would not have survived. They would not have caught that in time. Okay, so again, mechanism of injury makes a big difference. Okay, be sure the scene's safe. PPE, we talk about that a lot. Personal protective equipment. Have the person lie down, shines a sock. Shock, give CPR if needed. Um, if you're in a situation where you have an internal bleed and they go into CPR, or need CPR, uh, do your best you can. That's not a good scenario if they're dumping blood internally that CPR is going to be successful in this case. Okay. Some other signs, signs of shock, what they may see, uh, feeling weakness, dizzy, nausea, all the classic signs that you've read about for shock can certainly be there. Okay, 911, first aid kit, have the person lie down in recovery position. You don't want to lie flat on their back and some of the old books still say this. If you lie flat on the back and raise the legs, hey, that's good for shock. However, if your patient vomits, and there's a good possibility they will because they're in pain, uh, they're going to aspirate or suck the vomitous material into their lungs, and you're going to lose your patient. So always keep them in the recovery position if at all possible. You can still elevate the legs even though they're laying on the right-hand side. Okay, better for the patient. Moving the injury, or moving the injured rather, um, for the most part, you really don't have to move the person. We will move them when we get there. Uh, there really should be no need to do that. If you notice in the picture here, they're trying to move them as a unit safely. Uh, so by maintaining the head, neck, and, and alignment. But again, for the most part, we really don't want you trying to move a patient. This is important auto accidents. We see this a lot. In auto accidents, you get a lot of steam from the radiator, and everybody thinks the car is on fire. I've had more than one case when we find the person literally who is seriously injured drug across the road laying on the on the sidewalk over there. When we ask them why they moved the patient, the answer is the car is on fire, it's going to blow up. Well, here we are and the car hasn't blown up yet, so no, that's just steam. If you actually see flames, yeah, now you need to move that patient. But it's rare to actually have to move the patient, even in car accidents. I know on television, one car bumps another car and they both explode into flames. Occasionally that does happen, but for the most part, yeah, no. Take a quick look. Is there flames? Is there a reason for you to move this patient? If not, leave them where they're at, please. Wound care, we're going to talk about this more. You'll, you did a lot of this in the very beginning of the program when you watched that video on Stop the Bleed. But direct pressure is the very first thing. Pressure wraps, 
and hemostatic dressings where you're going to actually stuff the wound. We're going to probably come back with another video and show each one of these skills separately so you get an idea of what it physically looks like. But there's no way for me to kind of do that and show that at the same time. So we're going to do that in a separate video. Okay, amputations and avulsions. Amputations, it's a double bag routine. This, remember I said keep your Ziploc baggies handy. Okay, a Ziploc baggie, basically what you want to do, take it takes two Ziploc baggies. Take the first Ziploc baggie, turn it inside out, put your hand through it. Sometimes refer to this as like the dog doo-doo bag. You got a finger laying there, you reach over, grab the finger, pull it back into the bag and seal the bag. Then that first sealed bag with the part goes into the second bag where the ice is. Do not put the part directly on ice or where it can come in contact with water. If it comes in contact with water, the cells will suck the water in and explode and damage the part. So remember, it's always a double bag routine. The first sealed bag is put into the second bag where the ice is to cool the part. Okay? Okay, it says right there, do not let the part touch the ice. Okay, five types of amputations. Kind of common sense here. You have arms, hands, fingers, foots, and legs. Okay, I should say feet instead of foots, but whatever. Legs. Sometimes you have to think outside the box. You don't have a Ziploc baggie that's going to fit a leg. But what can you put it in? A clean trash bag. Seal the first trash bag, put that trash bag into the second trash bag where the ice is, and now you've got the part cooled down and ready for transport. Okay, so sometimes you need to think a little bit outside the box to make this work. Eye injuries. Oh, signs of eye injuries. Pain, trouble seeing, bruising, bleeding, redness or swelling. All classic for, sign in, for eye injuries. Remember with all eye injuries you want to cover not only the injured eye but the other eye. So both eyes get covered. The reason for that is if the person's looking around, remember your eyes track. So both eyes keep moving. Okay, so you don't want them to keep moving, especially if there's like a little piece of glass or something in the one eye. No, you're cutting that eye to shreds. Cover both eyes. Explain to your patient what you're doing. Because when you do cover both eyes, they're going to get very upset over the fact that now they can't see. Okay, so cover both eyes, but make sure you tell them why. And impaled objects, if there's an impaled object in the eye, you want to cover that with some type of a cup that protects it. Also, again, cover both eyes. You don't want them looking around because now you do have a lot of damage. Anything else stuck in the body stays in the body. So if you've got a knife or a stick or anything stuck anywhere else in the body, it stays in the body. Do not remove it. And what you'll do is build up around it to maintain it, to keep it stable, and then the patient can be moved safely. Okay. Toxic injuries in the eye, these are like things like a battery explosion, things like that. Always remember that you're going to wash the eyes. And the picture they're going to show, I'm going to point out something that's incorrect. You always wash from the nose out. So you turn the head, flush from the nose out past this eye, flush from the nose out past that eye. Okay, do not wash across the face because there's a possibility you can wash a toxic or contamination into the good eye. So never flush that way. Always flush each eye independently. Okay, here's an eye, our eye wash station. And you can see that actually fl flows into both eyes. Here's a eye wash that you physically squirt into the eyes. And here's the one I was telling you about. Notice they're flushing from the top up here across the good eye. So you don't want to do that. Flush each eye independently from the nose out so that it doesn't get into the good eye. Okay, okay open chest wound. You'll usually hear those gurgling or bubbling. Want to cover those with an occlusive dressing so that the air can't get back out. And also look for an exit wound. If a person's been shot in the chest, there's a good possibility not only do you have a hole up front, but you've got a hole in the back. Both holes have to be closed. Abdominal wounds. Okay, what if you've got some bowel showing? Um, bottom line is you want to cover that with a moist dressing. One thing that actually works very well is aluminum foil. Aluminum foil maintains the moisture, which is great, but it also maintains body heat, which is good. So aluminum foil in your first aid kit is a good thing to carry uh, and works very well on the patient. So again, it maintains the moisture and keep in mind that whatever came out of that patient, they're never going to put back in the patient. They're literally going to separate the two ends and put it back together that way. So anything that's actually come out of the patient, your bowel does not get put back in the patient, so they don't stuff it back in there. Okay? Head, neck, and spinal cord injuries. Again, this is going to be something you suspect based upon what you're finding in your patient. When you do your secondary survey, 
Do they not feel the one leg that you're feeling down? Keep in mind that you don't want to give this away. When you say to them, here, push down with your foot. If one foot moves and the other one doesn't, repeat the procedure the exact same way you did the first time. One leg, then the other leg. Do not say things to your patient like, oh, the one foot's not moving. They really don't want to need to know that at that point in time. Uh, it's not we're trying to lie to them. We want to keep them as calm as possible. So it's information for you to know that you need to relay to the EMS when they get there. But it's a way of checking out. One thing that I had questioned in reference to this slide, because some of this stuff comes right out of the book. If they're over 65, okay, I'm over 65. I'm not exactly sure how that means I'm supposed to have a spinal cord injury. Uh, okay, so uh, trouble walking, moving body parts. Okay, that's every morning when I get up. So this is significant for somebody that's had some type of injury that you've seen happen. Mechanism, mechanism, mechanism. Okay, do not move the patient. Well, I noted in cars on fire, I got for real. Uh, check for obvious signs of internal bleeding, yada, yada, yada. Start CPR if necessary. Okay, selected stroke. Uh, the big thing for stroke, again, is to do the FAST system, which is facial drooping, arm weakness, speech troubles, and time. You know, we've got approximately three hours to get a stroke patient in for treatment. And that seems like, my gosh, three hours. That's, that's plenty of time. But in reality, the average time to get a stroke patient into the ER is approximately two hours and 40 minutes. Two hours and 40 minutes to get them into the emergency room. Now, this isn't some strange time where they're out millions of miles from help. This is local. And I will guarantee you, two hours and 30 minutes of that is I don't need no damn ambulance. No, in some cases, you need to take the place of the parent. You need to become the parent. They need to get into the ER, 911. Let us get out there and talk to them and convince them that they need to go into the hospital. Okay, because most of the time they're, not, they're going to refuse service. Uh, but once we get there and talk to them, pretty much we can talk them into going to the emergency room where they can give them some clot busting agents and we'll actually stop the stroke at that point in time. Okay, diabetics, things to look for. Low blood sugar and high blood sugar. Actually, the biggest problem here is low blood sugar. Low blood, low blood sugar can cause a lot of serious in, problems for the brain. Uh, brain cells die, a lot of injuries to the patient. High blood sugar causes some other issues, but usually not fatal. Low blood sugar can be. So, we want to try to find out, it says signs of irritation, confusion, excess of hunger, thirst. These are all signs of diabetic issues, but even better still, is there a history of diabetes? in which case it kind of explains why they're acting that way. Okay, Low blood sugar, you want to take action. You always hear people say, oh, they're, they're a diabetic, you can't give them sugar. No, we need sugar to stay alive. So even diabetics will get sugar. Now, in the field, we have medications that we can give that will handle this. As a first aider or first responder, you really don't carry the same things that we carry. However, you do carry things like cake frosting. Cake frosting, put under the tongue of the patient. Remember, just don't squirt it in the mouth. We don't want an airway obstruction. But placed under the tongue of the patient will add some sugar to that patient. And even if they are high, in other words, the glucose levels are high, it will not harm the patient. But that little bit of sugar underneath the tongue can actually stop some brain damage. Okay, so cake frosting, as far as I know, doesn't have an expiration date. And you can carry it in your first aid kit without issues. Other things that you might carry do have expiration dates on them, and they cannot be kept in hot environments or things like that. Cake frosting, eh, can't hurt anybody. Okay, brain and concussions. Now we're actually doing things like possible concussions for kids. Okay, back in my day, hey, the thing was walk it off. That wasn't smart. But the bottom line is we're looking for possible brain concussions. If a person's knocked out, goes unconscious because of a head blow, then yeah, this is obviously possible signs of concussions and they really should be treated uh, for that. Think uh, cervical spine injuries. Again, do not move the patient if you don't have to. And here again, showing moving the person using a head neck stabilization if you have to. And again, don't move if you don't have to. Broken bones, sprains. Uh, for the most part, you have to think on your field in this case. You're not going to have uh, 500 hour splints with you when you're out in the field. So look around, things like paint stirs, tree limbs, other things that can act as a really good splint at that point in time. Always remember you want to splint above and below the joint. So that gives you the protection you need. Okay, these are things you should have done already. This shows kind of right there just as an ankle. So you're kind of above and below the injury. See it here. 
Remember, if you have a splint like this when it goes into the hospital, you will not get it back. Okay, it's gone. This shows an ice pack for possible sprain. Okay, if they still got injuries or, or pain later, it still needs to go in. Nosebleeds. Okay, what do we do for a nosebleed? Always pinch the nose and tilt the head forward, not back. That's an old wives' tale of back. You know, I used to say, well, why did your mother tell you back? Well, it kept the blood off the rug. But the bottom line is, if you tilt your head back, you start swallowing the blood. Blood is an irritant, which means if you get enough blood in the stomach, you will then vomit that back up again. And by the way, vomited blood looks like coffee grounds. It does not look like blood. So when you say to a person, they said, oh, I've been vomiting blood. The first question is, what did it look like? If they said it looked like coffee grounds, then that's serious. They've got enough blood into the stomach that the stomach acid is actually coagulating the blood, and that's what they're vomiting back up again. So that's serious. That's definitely 911. If they said, oh, it's red, when I, well, then they probably broke a couple capillary beds. Not as serious, but again, 911. It never hurts to get the ambulance to the location and let us take a look at the patient. Okay? But remember, pinch the nose, tilt the head back. I mean, tilt the head forward. I'm sorry, I just made the mistake myself. So again, there it is. Tilt the head forward, and where you're pinching right here on the sides of the nose. Okay? Pinch the nose, tilt the head slightly forward. Okay, dental injuries. Uh, I've only seen one of these in my career where a guy got hit in the mouth with a baseball, knocked a tooth out, and that's kind of what it looks like. Quite large, quite not as big as the picture here, but quite large. We ended up using a double bag routine and we took him to a dentist that could handle an orthopedic surgeon, actually. Um, I mean, a dental surgeon that was right there in Aberdeen, by the way, who took the patient in and treated the patient and it worked just fine. Some of the books that you see will actually talk about for you to stick it back in the hole. I do not recommend that, especially if it's already bounced on the ground somewhere. You're now going to possibly contaminate the patient with that and cause even a bigger problem. So just double bag it, get him into a dental facility that can handle them and let them handle it. Okay, burns. Okay, small burns, superficial burns. Okay, things like uh, sunburns and stuff like that. So a small burn, you can apply cold water, uh, not necessarily with ice, but cold water until the heat is actually out of it. And here's like a first degree sunburn. So by applying cold water to that, what you do is you actually suck the heat out of the burn and you stop the burn. You know, there's a, a wise tale people talk about that a sunburn's always worse at night. Well, that's not really true. What it is is, as the sun goes down, the asphalt around you cools down very quickly, and you are now the hottest thing around. Okay? So really, you are actually absorbed that sun's energy, and now you're giving it back off like a little heating element. So that's the logic behind this. Okay? So cold water on a first-degree burn. Second-degree burn is what we refer to as a multi-tissue level. Okay? At least the two top layers. You want to cool it for at least 10 to 15 minutes until it cools down again. Uh, you may have blisters. Do not apply anything to that. Do not apply any ointments and especially do not apply butter. We swear people carry that with them because we still see it on burns. Uh, so small second degree. Let me back up here so you see this. This would be considered a small second degree. If in fact that were entire back uh, or entire chest, now we're talking dry dressing, not cool. And the reason for that is second degree burn compromises the body's ability to maintain heat, your own inside temperatures. If we were to throw cold water on a massive second degree burn, we can actually put the patient into hypothermia and actually cause even more damage. So if it's a major second degree burn, that's now dry dressing. If it's a small one like you saw, that's cold water. Okay. Third degree, and that's actually, this is definitely a hospital time here because uh, they're going to need antibiotics, they're going to need fluids, uh, debreeding, where they're actually going to have to clean the wound. So that's not something we do in the field. So a third degree, again, going to be dry dressing and get them in. Fourth degree is a multi-layer, and this is even fifth degree as it's going into the bone. Okay, so a burn that goes into multiple layers and all the way into the bone is at least into a fifth degree, maybe even more. Bottom line, where do you see things like this? Some chemical burns will do things like that because it's on the skin for long contact. Electrical burns, we've had people that have been unconscious laying on electrical wire that's still uh, engaged and actually burn into the bone area. 
So there can be multiple burns. At this level, again, dry dressing, and this is definitely hospital time. Electrical burns, remember any, any electrical whatever, you need to make sure the power is turned off. If you can't turn the power off, do not touch the patient. There is no safe way to remove them if the power is still energized. Okay. Chemical burns, liquid burns, we want to flush with water, just keep on flushing. Dry chemical burns, you got to get all that off of them first. If you try to put liquid onto a chemical burn, you may activate the chemical and cause even more problems. So once you've got all that dry powder off of them and they're being burned out, now you can switch to liquid, but not right off the bat. Okay, fainting. This is also known as psychogenic shock. And what surprised me is some of the things that I'm seeing say that you don't have to discuss this in your first aid class. Well, fainting is a very common scenario. Uh, most males actually pass out more than females, especially at the site of blood. So you can anticipate that. And for the most part, basically all this is the blood vessels. Remember I said the arteries are muscular in nature. Well, basically the arteries open up, dilate, blood pressure drops, and the person passes out. Fairly easy to handle, just get him on the ground, recovery position, head's lower than body, blood flow returns, the person wakes back up again. However, if it's not handled correctly, uh, you can actually cause even more damage to the patient. I remember going into a location one time, two guys were dragging this guy, standing up, actually he was unconscious, they were dragging him around the floor, waiting him to go conscious again. We said to him, please get him on the floor, and the guy woke back up. So standing upright is not where you want them. You want them down in a safe position. Let blood flow return to the brain. Okay. Uh, for actual fainting, for you, again, help the person lay down. If they become unresponsive, check for pulse and breathing. You may have to begin CPR. Uh, near fainting, again, the lower you get them, the quicker they will respond. Uh, find out if they got any histories of anything, especially while they're still conscious. Uh, allergies, diabetic, heart disease, all these things you may be able to relay because once they go unconscious, we can't ask them any questions. Okay? Fainting, when it happens. And again, it usually only lasts a few seconds to a few minutes. So again, if you get them into the position we talked about, uh, they will return usually very quickly. And for the most part, without any problems. Seizure patients, seizures are pretty unique in the fact that almost all of us have had a seizure at one point or another. And the reason I say this is because seizures can actually run from a few split seconds all the way up to maybe 20 minutes. Rare, uh, sometimes uh, just a person staring at a wall. You know, any time of lost time and space. So if you've been daydreaming, that's actually considered seizure activity. You've lost time and space. You have no idea what just took place around you. So it can really be from a minor little thing to something important. Remember, a full-blown seizure patient uh, that is what we refer to as a grand mal seizure. On the floor, protect their airway, keep them on their side, or face down. Do not leave a seizure patient laying flat on their back. Again, if they vomit, they can aspirate. So maintain them on their side if you can. Place a hand, say, under the head so that they're not banging their head on the ground, so you're cushioning their blow. And the bottom line is, they'll usually do just fine. Do not stick anything in the mouth of a seizure patient. They will not swallow their tongue. Their tongue is attached, so you cannot physically swallow your tongue. However, if you're laying on your back, your tongue can relax and drop back and seal an airway. So again, on the side, recovery position. Watch them for vomiting. Okay? And pretty much what we just talked about. Protect them from any further injury. Get the furniture and stuff away from them. Make sure they're still breathing. Uh, the seizure patient can actually go into cardiac arrest. It's rare, but it can happen. So monitor their vitals. Make sure you still got breathing and pulse. Okay. Breathing difficulties. What causes breathing difficulties? Well, good Lord, a whole bunch of things. Shortness of breath. And you see they're all listed here. From COPD ears to asthma to croup to bronchitis, pneumonia, you name it, anything can cause difficulty breathing. Asthma, okay, squeaky. Mainly they get air in and have a hard time getting air out. And for the most part, they're going to be uh, handled with an inhaler. They probably got their inhaler. Shake it up, give it to them. They know how to take it. Uh, and basically the picture here is them taking the inhaler. To some people, there's a spacer so they can get some more air involved with the chemical. They're sucking it into their lungs. Some don't have that. Each inhaler is slightly different. But the patient themselves 
will probably know how to handle it. You may have to get it out of their bag and give it to them and let them use their inhaler. Allergic reactions. Uh, this again, person's allergic to something. It's rare for a person to go into anaphylactic shock the very first time they're exposed to something. That's pretty rare. However, if they've had a bad reaction to something in the past, like a bee sting, or say a food group, the very next time they're uh, uh, getting contact with that substance, they can actually go anaphylactic. So from the first time where they got hives and itching, the very next time can be anaphylactic. So you want to talk to your doc if you've had any reactions like that, so you can get an EpiPen ready for you that you carry with you. Remember that EpiPens do have expiration dates on them, so you got to make sure you got a current EpiPen, uh, especially for our daycare centers out there if you're watching this. Wasn't anything unusual when I get the location, ask them, show me your, your EpiPens to find two or three that are expired. So again, make sure the dates are good. Okay. Again, kind of what I just talked about. Administering EpiPen, pull the cap off. A little red cap is usually on this end. That, take that off. It's then armed, and you put it up against their leg. It's an IM injection. There's a pediatric size and an adult size. The real difference here is the size of the needle and the amount of medication. If they're going to push this through, say, a, a pair of pants, make sure there's nothing in the pocket. Okay, This is a one-time shot here. If you go to hit it in their pocket and they've got, say, coins or change in their pocket and it hits that, you've lost the chance of putting that epi on board. Remember that this epi, a one shot like this, will hold your patient for approximately 20 minutes. Okay, after that, they're going to have problems again. So it's still 911 and you want to administer this the second they begin to have breathing problems. So they start having breathing problems, it's time for the epi. Abdominal pain, not a lot you can say about this. Uh, it can be anything from indigestion to gas pains to whatever, but the bottom line is, if it's serious, you need to call 911. They need to get into the hospital. Pregnancy complications, my gosh, there's a ton of those. Not much you can do this as a first responder. This is definitely a 911. Get as much background history again as you remember on your patient in case they do go unconscious, but find out everything you can about it. Write it all down so that we have that when we arrive location. Uh, ingested or inhaled poisons. Uh, there can be a lot of different things that's an ingested or inhaled poison. Uh, especially depending on what area of the country you're in, where you're located. You'll find certain plants are more prevalent in some areas than others. Uh, so again, know what could be possibly in your area, what some of those things may smell like, uh, so that you can make a quick diagnosis as far as what might be happening with them. Uh, dehydration. And we're certainly in the season right now, summer, for heat cramps, heat, heat exhaustion, heat stroke. That's the three biggies. Heat cramps, just like that, you've got some cramps, heat exhaustion, you're exhausted. Heat stroke is life-threatening. Okay, heat cramps, generalized muscle cramps. You want to cool the person to a cool location and let them drink some cool fluids. Not cold, just cool fluids. And let them rehydrate. Heat exhaustion, a little bit worse. Okay, they're having, starting to have problems regulating their heat. Uh, in their body, so again, cool location, cool fluids. The biggie here is heat stroke. Inside, can, inside temps on your patient can exceed 105 degrees. So if you're familiar with that, you're actually beginning to cook the brain at 105. So they're hot to touch. When you touch the skin, there's no sweating. They're literally hot. So for them, you want a 911 cool location. Place cold packs in the armpits, the groin area, the neck area, and soak the patient's clothing in cool water. You want to try to get them cooled down, cooled down as fast as possible uh, because the stroke is literally damaging the brain at this point in time. This is a true emergency. Hypothermia, just the opposite. If they drop below, it says below 95 degrees. And what's a normal body, 98.6? That's not very far, is it? So hypothermia can set in and again is kind of a true emergency. So I think below 95 degrees is a true emergency for hypothermia. Insect stings. Where is a whole list of there of things that sting us? Okay, remember if the stinger's left in, scrape it off credit card, fingernail. Do not grab the little sting sack because you'll push the rest of the venom into the patient. So again, kind of a, a procedure to get that out of the patient. Okay, scrape it out, credit card. Snake bites. Okay, this is kind of unique because in Maryland, 
and that's where I'm speaking from, but we have instructors literally all over the world. So for you, when you're looking at putting this together, make sure that you highlight the snakes that are in your area. Okay, in Maryland, everybody wants to talk about water moccasins. We do not have water moccasins in Maryland. Okay, not native to Maryland. Okay, uh, we do have a copperhead and a timber rattler that are native to Maryland. Okay, so know what snakes are in your area so people can identify them. Uh, very important. Other countries, things like a black mamba. We'll take a look here. Here's a copperhead, what it looks like. Okay, notice a triangular shaped head. Okay, timber rattler. Again, found out in Western Maryland, not in our local cities or things like that, although the copperhead can be found all over Maryland. And here's something that is in Africa called a black mamba. A black mamba is a neurotoxin. Uh, it can travel at something like 12 miles an hour and literally uh, lays a territory line out with scent. And if you travel into its territory, it sees that you attacking it and it will attack you. And I think it's 12 miles per hour they can actually travel, which is a little bit faster than you can like estimate the snake is coming. Okay, so again, pretty nasty guy, not found in Maryland, but for some of our African instructors, hey, you maybe have to talk about this guy. Spider bites. Two biggies here in Maryland are the black widow and the brown recluse, also known as the fiddle spider. Interesting, the black widow again usually is not fatal, sting like a bee. The brown recluse can be fatal if it gets into the bloodstream. Uh, so out of the two, really, the brown recluse is the more nasty of the two. Here's the black widow. That's a web spider, so they build webs. You see the red hourglass underneath of her. Okay. And again, for the most part, not fatal unless it's a small child, multiple bites, or stings, I should say. The brown recluse, you can see the fiddle spider located on its back. So again... For the most part, these do not see you and attack you. If you put your hand against them, they see that, that you're attacking them and they bite to defend themselves. Okay. Tick bites, good heavens. Uh, every day we're hearing about a new disease carried by ticks. Again, the big one here in Maryland is the deer tick, uh, very tiny. And you take a look at this picture, that's a picture of a dime. And you start looking at the size of some of these ticks, difficult to see. And not everybody gets the bullseye rash that we, you know, we look at and we go, oh, that's limes. Excuse me, not everybody has the bullseye rash and can have limes. Okay, Europe is way ahead of us on their treatment for limes. U.S. is, is really backwards. Jellyfish, jellyfish sting with a chemical base. If you remember your chemical class, A to B, acid to base, they use a base to sting with. So mild acid. Uh, like a vinegar, diluted vinegar or something, would actually stop their sting. Um, kind of unique for jellyfish. And we don't have the really big, bad ones like the Man of Wars here in Maryland, uh, but definitely an issue. Okay, picture here. Stingrays, we do have stingrays. I mean, we do have rays, but not like the big stingrays that you see. Uh, barbed tail that injects the venom. Treat with hot water, 30 to 60 minutes. But keep in mind, not so hot that it's going to actually burn the patient. Okay. There's a picture of a stingray. And if you look real close, if you blow the picture up, you'll see what looks like a little bit of a barb hanging out of the back. Okay. Humans or other animal bites, soap and water, uh, control the bleeding. And you may going to need some antibiotics or something uh, to take after the bite. Okay. There's a good bite there. There's a picture of one you don't want to be involved with. Okay, so that's kind of it for right now. Kind of a quick wrap up of some of the things that I talk about when we're doing a first aid class. Kind of went through pretty quick, but again, you can slow this down, look at the slide. Uh, if you would like to get a copy of this, let me know. I will email you the PowerPoint that I'm using. Um, and it's that simple. Feel free to add things to it, take things out of it. Manipulated so it kind of fits your area and especially your location because there are definitely certain things uh, like I said with snakes uh, Your water moccasins are more in the Virginia, North Carolina area So for my instructors that are in those general areas, you might want to reinforce that Because everybody sees a snake in the water. They all think it's a water moccasin. All snakes can swim So Florida, it's got a coral snake, neurotoxin again So depending on where you're located, you might want to modify this so that it kind of fits your people in your area. 
Uh, again, I want to thank you for tuning in, um, and hopefully this will come in handy for you. Take care, and have a good one.